Uh, I mean, I, my friends... Be a historian. Hmm? Be a historian. <laughs> my friends in, Washington, in, in New York who know a lot about finance, uh, I once said to one of them, what do you think about the market? And he said, well, I'm optimistic. And I said, why do you look so worried then? And he said, because I'm not sure my optimism is justified. <laughs> but my friends in, 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 on Wall Street, or the, uh, economic journalists say, the bailout was probably absolutely necessary to keep everything from unraveling. But there should have been much stronger consumer protections, much stronger regulations required uh, of the banks when they were bailed out. We're, you know, we're going to get our money back from those bailouts, but the effects of the, of, of the economic catastrophe in the fall of 2008 on people like Connie Bressel and Natalie Ford and millions of others will never be mitigated or ameliorated, not in my lifetime at least. So, but you know, as Dick Durbin, Senator Durbin, the number two Democrat in the Senate said on my show about why the, regu the financial re reform bill wasn't going to have more teeth in it. He said because the banks own the place, meaning they own the Senate. So there was, I think if I had been president, <laughs> I probably would have had to put together a save the financial system. But I would think having grown up a new dealer and having been in the Kennedy Johnson administrations and having some familiarity as a jerk working journalist with these issues, I would have asked a lot more of the people we bailed out and put in a lot more safeguards than we've got in this present financial reform bill. There's some good things in it, but not enough teeth. Particularly, we've left the six big banks too big to fail. And as long as they're too big to fail, the risk factor there is not very great for them. And we didn't exact enough concessions on, on, on bonuses and all of that. So I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't done it. I think it would have been terrible. And I actually have some feeling for Obama on this. Obama hasn't surprised me. I mean, I told the young African Americans on our staff in 2008, certainly I wanted to see an African American elected president in my lifetime. When we passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, late one night, I said to President Johnson, I, I was there, you know, you think we'll have a, uh, an African American president in our lifetime? He said, oh, of course not. He said, we'll have a woman president far long sooner than we will have uh, an African-American president. I wanted to see that happen because that's a great breakthrough in the mindset of a people who've been locked in the legacy of slavery and race and color. Uh, and unfortunately, race is unspokenly but powerfully a part of what's going on right now. The right has a stake in defeating the first black president because if they hadn't gone after him after and, had, and the bailout had worked, then the Republican history of having been cast into the wilderness after the debacle of 29 and 30 would have come home to haunt them again. Also because the core of the, of the conservative um, agenda now is about preserving the white homogeneity of a party that has no other members. And, and if Obama had succeeded as the first black president, uh, it would have ended that coalition, which began, by the way, when Lyndon Johnson beat Barry Goldwater, and Barry Goldwater opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and the South and all the white conservatives all over the country began to flock to that conservative party. That's a long way from your question about the bailout, but <laughs> you can see how the mind of, a, of an analyst goes. Yes, sir. Mr. Moyers, uh, my name is Jeff. Um, I can't tell you how much... I appreciate and am grateful for your work over the years on uh, PBS, WGBH, where we see you. Uh, you're, you're an inspiration, and I could just talk for many minutes on that. Um, oh, go, I ahead. Also... <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you can pay me later. I also uh, am admire and am very grateful for the fire that you still are, are demonstrating and that you can inspire others to have. It's so important and also invoking Howard Zinn's legacy as well. What you have described is a nightmare, <clears throat> it, and a nightmare in the sense that it doesn't seem real. The, it's painful. The America that I grew up with you know, as a school kid in the 50s and 60s was the, the nation of good. You know, the, the good, idealistic nation that we believed in, the pillar of democracy, beacon to the world. It isn't anymore as you described it. Yes, we're a great country, we're great people, but 
uh, democracy is going down the, you know, down the tubes. And I, I look at my fellow alumni here. I looked around a few times. I went to graduate school here. I see 300 people in the room, perhaps, uh, many with gray hair, some young folks, many in between. And I wonder if they believe you. And if they believe what you're saying, I believe you. You're not the only journalist uh, and commentator I listen to, on, uh, Robert Reich and, and many other folks. I believe what you say is happening. I'm scared. And I wonder about apathy. About what? Apathy. If we're apathetic, if we, uh, if we just think, hey, what the heck can we do? You've outlined a little bit about what we can do. But there are three, 400 people here, something like that. I wonder if each of us are going to try to do something more, another step, go to a foreclosure uh, uh, prevention rally that they have, or join some progressive group like Common Cause or, or one of the others that you've mentioned, and take some step. Uh, I hope, if, if, you, if you don't mind my saying so, I hope so. I mean, I, I get your point, and I'll come back to it. I hope so, because I don't have any panaceas or grand strategies. Uh, you know, as far as fear and the nightmare, Paul Krugman says the last two, the last sentence in his column today in the New York Times, be very afraid, be afraid, be very afraid. And Krugman is a much smarter, more knowledgeable man than I am, and he sees things happening out there that uh, I, I don't understand, but I know, I, I believe him uh, when, when, when he uh, does that. I know, you know, we weren't, people weren't apathetic in 19, in, in, in 2008, 68 million people turned out to vote, and so many of those young people, so many of them were young people. I remember Obama's speech at the Democratic National Convention in 2004. It was here in Boston, wasn't it? You remember that, how people were, were stirred? So they aren't apathetic, but they are, but many people are not apathetic, but they're very confused and uncertain about what to do. Even David Brooks today has a column about the things people can do out across the country because when our national political culture is locked, as it is in Washington, when it's paralyzed, you can't really expect to accomplish much in Washington. So there are a lot of things going on here. For example, we did a report on Bill Moyer's Journal about the community organizing in Boston on foreclosure issue. It was so inspiring. Those folks could use Steve, what was his name, Sally? Meacham. Meacham. Steve right. Meacham. Steve could use some help. He could use some allies out there. Uh, there are things to do. I can't tell you what they are. You can find them. And I do hope everybody gets up tomorrow morning and says, I can't, I can't alone solve the problem of big money in politics, but I can find some way. And every day, keep it up. Because it does, as I say. I used to say to people, if your issue is the environment, if your issue is women's issues, if your issue uh, is uh, gender equality, if your issue is living wage, your second issue should always be the media, because without an informed press, we can't know what's going on. Now I say, as I said a moment ago, whatever your other issues, money in politics needs to be uh, the first issue, because you're not going to solve those others if you don't. Now, as to a nightmare, as to people, believe me, I mean, I hope people think about the analysis that I did and the facts. I'll, we'll publish this on the web on Monday, and you can see the argument I make and the footnotes to almost everything I said here. But to a considerable degree, we are in denial. I know something about denial. We almost lost our oldest son when he was 30 because we were in denial about his addiction and alcoholism. And they will forget the day, uh, I mean, we'd grown troubled about it for the last month, but we didn't want to believe this about our 30-year-old son who was a great reporter on, on, on Long Island and a good churchman and recently married to a wonderful woman and a good citizen who'd been perfect in high school and college. You know, I, I, I couldn't believe this bizarre behavior that he was experiencing. And so I took him to lunch one day and I said, finally got up the nerve to say, let me tell you, are you using something? And uh, he said, oh no, dad, I've just got some trouble at home. So I said, good, let's, and then changed the subject. The next day he disappeared, totally went off the edge. My wife and a friend found him a week later in a crack house and got him out. He went back to recovery, collapsed again. I pulled him out of a crack house in St. Paul. A year went by, crashed again, and, and um, I pulled him out with two policemen with their guns uh, at the ready from a crack house in Atlanta. 
And we, we almost lost him because we had not wanted to believe that what we saw it before our eyes was true. And I think that's, that it's hard for us to believe this. Look, we're only 250 years old as a democracy. We're very young. And yet to be in this trouble right now with you know, the deficits, a dysfunctional government, nobody's talking about the war anymore. Nobody wants to talk, talk to Andrew Bacevich today. Nobody wants to talk about, even discuss Iraq or Afghanistan. Well, that right now while we're sitting here comfortable and having a good time, there are guys out there in the cold fighting war, they couldn't explain to you why they're fighting it. Even as the president of, the, of Afghanistan takes bags of cash from Iran. It doesn't make any sense. But you can't get people to, I don't know what it is. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I wish I were. But I do know that just as the gross national product is important to a country, so is the gross national psychology. And our gross national psychology is really schizophrenic right now. And I don't have an answer. I used to think that the answer was information. That's why I was a journalist. Inform people they'll do the right thing. But there was a big study out last week, I think, Dean, from the University of Wisconsin. I'm not sure. Maybe it was Michigan, uh, which got reported, by the way, in the Boston Globe, because that's where I found it online by accident. Uh, about how facts no longer, contravening facts no longer matter. You probably saw the article. That even if people, that, that if people read something that defies their understanding of the issue, they will believe what they understand to be the issue and not the fact. That's very troubling. It's denial. So I am concerned and I think the only answer is an aroused citizenry. And I think something like what I was talking about tonight and what Howard would be talking about, which is the larger issue of saving our society for my five grandchildren. Look, there are times when I want to give up. I despair. I don't like talking like this. I'd rather come tonight and, 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 and talk about all those wonderful poets and historians and philosophers that I interviewed over the years. We've got a book coming out about them next spring. I would much rather have done that. I don't like this kind of talk. Thank you but, for talking yeah, like this. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Morris. Uh, Jeff said he feels that people are apathetic. I feel just the opposite. I think Americans are really engaged today, and they really want to see something better happen in the United States, and you're uh, talking about a lot of those issues. But what I find really interesting, I think that what's going on now, it's really indiscriminate. It's not whether it's right or left or Republican or Democratic or color or whatever. I think there's a collusion of power with the politicians. It, uh, Eisenhower talked about, about it with the military industrial complex. It's happening. That has been in place for too long, and I think what we have is power corrupts. I'm really disappointed with our politicians. It seems they like they lose their soul, and we're trying to find out how to make our, our country more fiscally responsible. I think that's a right or left or democratic or republic position. What's wrong with those ideas? I agree with you, by the way. And that's what I, I think we should have more discussion about those that, things. The subject of my conversation And early, I think Howard Zinn, excuse me, would be very excited about the fact right. that people are engaging themselves today. I, in I agree with you, people are engaged. By the way, on just one small measure of applications for the Peace Corps, which I did help to found back in 1960 and 61, are at a record high this year. Uh, and I that's find great. lots of young people doing it. But Andrew Basevich and I talked earlier today about how do we move the conversation between left, beyond left and right. We don't have an answer yet. We have some interesting considerations, but that's what we have to do because most of the country is not left or right. I'm a progressive. I believe in progressive action, but I used to, I grew up being able to talk to conservatives. Now I can't. They don't want to talk. They won't come on my show, you know, but, but, but I do believe in it. Thank you very much. We'll go over here. Good evening, Mr. Moyers. Uh, my name is Patrick, current student at BU. And this weekend is in Washington, D.C., um, the comedian John Stewart is hosting the rally to restore sanity. And I want to ask your opinion, how come we have had to have a comedy show resort to such a serious topic, such as um, bringing back um, the ideals to the media, which was freedom of speech, but at the same time reporting the truth. So I want to know, um, how come we've had to resort to this, um, this point so late in the game? Like, what's your opinion on this? Well, I, I think that John Stewart's secret is the same as Mark Twain's. I said when I went on Stewart's show, he was on my first show when we came back with the journal, and then he asked me to come on his. And I said to him on his show, 
If Mark Twain were back today, he'd be you. He'd have found a way to move and operate in this medium. And the reason for Mark Twain's enormous popularity and John Stewart's is that the truth goes down with humor more quickly and effectively than it does coming from a journalist or a historian or uh, even a teacher. That's something about human nature that will absorb and listen to the truth when it has come, when, it, when there's a twinkle in the eye of the person telling it and even a joke. You responded more when I told a few little stories than you did any other time. So, you know, I, I'm an admirer of, of, of um, Stuart because he has an amazing job of analysis. And what is analysis? Analysis is looking at contradictory evidence and trying to interpret the significance of it. And that's what he does every night with these juxtaposition of videos, uh, you know, so that you, you don't have to say, as I did tonight, Mitch McConnell is a hypocrite if you just play those two videos, one of which says, well, the Sunshine Laws will make sure that uh, Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision, the people know who's spending the money, and then the opposition he made of getting every Republican to vote against it. Now, tomorrow's rally is interesting. I mean, I believe in public gatherings. They, I do. I, I just love public gatherings, uh, and I think that'll be good. My, I, I am an admirer of of uh, sanity, uh, and I'm an admirer of, Stu of Stuart, but it, you know, we can crack jokes to in impotence if we don't take the next step, and the next step is A, to vote on Tuesday, and B, to do what we're talking about tonight, find some way when you're not voting to remain an engaged, active, participating, and defiant citizen. Yes. Um, I, I know you recently said um, that oh, you were quoting uh, something that said that uh, people getting information that is counter to their point of view, you know, uh, people don't change their mind. Um, but I, I feel like there are a lot of um, analyses that don't even make it to the public square. Um, I'm, you know, watch democracy now basically from my news. Um, and when I listen to even NPR, I guess what's particularly disturbing to me right now is that, um, you know, NPR I find um, is, doesn't cover news in a way and in the depth and with analysis that say something like democracy now would. Um, you know, Air America was here uh, for a while, and then I don't, I'm not quite sure, you know, why that's off the screen. The the stations where I it feel died. like you really get analysis, you know, you died. can't even get them on your dial because they're so weak. So how do you get that, you know, um, well, really I, different analysis into the public it's hard. square? It, it, it's very hard, and I find my fault with, obviously, with the mainstream media, the corporate press, is right. that they don't go where they should go. And my problem with many of my colleagues in public broadcasting is that they cover the news, but they don't uncover the right. news. Right, exactly. You know, I, one of my uh, professors at the University of Texas once said to me, he was a great journalism teacher, DeWitt Reddick, and he said to me, uh, news is what people want to keep hidden, everything else is publicity. Huh. And, and, and that's true. And a student asked the journalist Richard Reeves, a wonderful journalist, uh, what's your definition of real news? And Dick Reeves said, the news that helps us keep our freedoms. And that's news that people don't want exposed, and too few journalists do that. Now the web has opened this up. I think there will, we're entering what really will be a great era of, of independent journalism if we can find a way to pay them. Because independent journalists don't have to have a filter of an institution, a corporation, or the corporate, you know, General GE, which owns, did own, it does still own uh, the, e, the NBC News or the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which is a filter between Congress and public broadcast. On the web, you can find a lot of really interesting and, and I think honest uh, opinion. Andrew Sullivan on one side, Josh Marshall on another side. And, and I referred a moment ago to 1840 when there were a thousand printing presses uh, in, in this country. Um, they clashed all the time, they were, but they were independent. 
and you saw them that way. You don't really know what you're seeing when you watch the evening news of a corporate uh, operation. So you have to work at it. There, this is a, going to be a golden age of independent journalism through the web, but it means you have to work a lot harder to be well informed. And of course, there's no recipe for easy citizenship. If you do want to be informed, you really can be, but you have to work at it. So you've got to go to many sources, test what they're saying about each other, listen to democracy now, listen to uh, others. I, I, like you, I'm a great admirer of Amy Goodman because I think while she's progressive, she's also very informed and fair, and you know where she's coming from. Yes? Oh, good evening. Um, I was recalling a, a show that you had uh, George Soros on, and he mentioned something to the effect of unfettered capitalism, uh, you know, was a dangerous thing. Um, and I think about the rollback or, or Glass-Steagall Act and many regulations being overturned, and I'd like to get your thoughts about, uh, you know, how to how do, I know you're talking about citizen, uh, citizenry being activated, but how do you uh, go against corporate America, Wall Street, when regulations that are supposed to control them are undermined? Well, it's hard to get those regulations when Congress is, as I said earlier, owned by the very people that it's supposed to regulate, and government has been hollowed out and, and replaced with industry lawyers and lobbyists and, and uh, executives from the industries being regulated has happened totally under the Bush administration. The, uh, the, uh, a good thing about the Obama administration that isn't ever written about is that, uh, is that he is replacing a lot of the old George W. Bush bureaucracy with people who are not right wing, and, and, and that's very helpful. I mean, it, that's the perennial question, how do I signify against the powers that be, and, you have to find a way to do that that gives you where you are with whom you are uh, to do that and join with others. I mean, Common Cause is really, and public citizens really are uh, taking on this Citizens United decision. And they need local constituents, they need contributions, they need an informed laity that's backing them on that. Look them, check them out on the, uh, on, on, on the web. Um, but you are more likely to find a way to signify where you live in this town, in your neighborhood, then I can, can advise you. But there are really ways uh, uh, to do it. We do have to belong to a political party because that's the whole, you know, that's, that's the tragedy of representative democracy. We're supposed to be able to send our Washington, our representatives to Washington to exercise their best judgment. But they now have to, as that young man said, they're, they disillusion us because they can't deliver on their promises because they spend all their time raising money. i tell you one very important thing you can do, and this was a disappointment about your state of Massachusetts. I was involved a number of years ago in what's called uh, public, fund, uh, public Campaign. That's an organization that set out to sell the idea of public funding for elections. Uh, and we did sell it, the organization, and citizens sold it uh, in Maine, Massachusetts, Arizona and Oregon. And what it meant is that if you reach a certain threshold uh, of small contributions, you can get funds from the state that help to a certain level, not extravagantly, you maintain your campaign. So that you can run a, a, a successful campaign against a millionaire or, or a billionaire. It's gone very well in Maine, very well in Portland as, as a city, very well in Arizona, believe it or not, and Connecticut, that was the third one. But here in Massachusetts, even though 67% of the people in a referendum approve public funding, the state legislature is almost as corrupt as the Albany legislature or the Austin legislature. I mean, when I was a young reporter on, the new, on a television station in Austin covering crime accidents and car wrecks and all that, I always went up to the uh, Capitol Hill, uh, up to the state legislature, and thought that was the biggest crime scene of all. I mean, but, but public funding has helped teachers to run for office, labor people to run for office, home, homemakers to run for office, state legislature, uh, and others. So find out about the public fund. It's called publiccampaign.org, uh, and it's working nationwide. We're going to win that one one day, not in my lifetime, but it's going to take people like you who get up every morning and try to persuade your neighbors they should fund, help to support public campaign, public funding. 
two more questions, then I think we should stop. It's almost nine o'clock. Okay. Well, so I'm going to lose my voice. Very encouraged by your sharing with us the sense of anxiety and denial in the country. There is a scale of denial that has to do with transnational realities that we're not confronting at all, including the fact that water runs downhill and the ice melts at 32 degrees, and yet every single candidate from the Republican Party seems to be running on the plank that ice doesn't melt, that water doesn't flow downhill, and that carbon in the atmosphere is not a problem. Is there any suggestion you might have to bring us back to some biophysical realities of the way the ecosystem works and what we're up against? Because no, one of I, your I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. This is really troubling. It's part of what the question earlier was, why, why would you be pessimistic? You're exactly right about, about, about the Republicans. They, they, they don't believe in climate. They don't believe science. Right. They don't like science in no small part because their, their evangelical and fundamentalist Christian constituency doesn't believe in science. They believe in evolution. Uh, and so they don't, I mean, they're just almost unanimous in, in denial. Right. It's astonishing. It really is. And I don't know how to convince them uh, otherwise. It, and it sort of dropped off the, 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 the map. This is the troubling thing about our dysfunction. You would think that a democracy could find a way to solve the problems we create for ourselves. I mean, we all have waste. So we get together and pay a municipal garbage uh, service to get rid of our waste. Uh, you would think a democracy would do that on every issue. But when it comes to global climate change, the anti-scientific bias of the conservative movement is, uh, uh, is, a, is, is a wall, impenetrable wall there. So it's impossible for beleaguered Democrats, although they have tried uh, in a political system dominated by money from energy companies that don't want us to diminish our reliance on fossil fuel to move the ball toward the goalpost. I'm a very dear friend and colleague of Bill McKibben, the great environmental writer who organized uh, thousands of young people around the world in a movement called 350.org. And they showed up at the Copenhagen conference and I saw a shot of Bill on the news in which I, his face was crestfallen. He was standing in the corner because he was watching the representatives of the great powers and the lobbyists for the industries quash any effort to be sensible and significant on, on climate change. Make a note of this. Go to 350.org and read it. The, the, the most interesting work on climate change is being done by McKibben and a group of young people out of Middlebury, Vermont. It's for young people. Pardon me? It's, it's not just for young people. No, no, I'm sorry about that. I mean anybody under 70. Right. right. Well, in so. a sense, it's giving us another thing to believe in. And if, uh, as one of your former interviewees, uh, Bill Coffin, used to say, if you don't stand for something, you can fall for anything. And the problem is that people aren't standing on the scientific information that we now have. Oh, no. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, my name is David Rubin. I uh, taught at BU from 1968 through 73 in the English department. And I work closely with Howard on uh, all kinds of activism that was happening on this campus. And I just wanted to recall very briefly that Howard uh, was arrested here in the George Sherman Union uh, in the spring of 1972 when VU was really a campus in turmoil, had been already for a number of years. Uh, I was arrested with him. What happened very I, I really have to be careful here <laughs> uh, of, you no, know, just time, I mean, just time, uh, was that um, there had, uh, John Silver, of course, was president. He was for the war. He, uh, there were efforts to uh, protest military recruitment at BU. There had been a demonstration on Bay State Road uh, earlier in that particular week in which students uh, had been beaten badly 
by the Boston Tactical Police Unit, which was a special unit devoted to suppressing uh, civil unrest. And uh, later in the week came an anti-war rally downtown, and that spilled over into a student takeover of uh, administrative offices here in the George Sherman Union. Uh, Howard and Roz and my wife Ellie and I and others were at a potluck dinner. We got a call that, that uh, Howard got a call, I should say, <laughs> that students had, had uh, uh, taken over the, the uh, administrative offices here in the union and um, he was asked to come down and join them, which he did. And I went with him uh, that night. It was a Friday night. And it was an all-night event. Uh, we were very concerned about violence. We, and, and this is really what I what would hope you would be able to comment on a little bit, Howard's w amazing commitment to nonviolence. We were very concerned about violence because not only was BU a hotbed of activism, but it was also a heavily infiltrated campus by uh, government agents. There, there, there were uh, agents uh, going in and out of the administration building all the time. And what we realized in the course of that long night was that this takeover had also been infiltrated. And there were really provocateurs among the, uh, the people who had taken over the building. So there were two issues. One was how to make sure that there was no violence committed against the university. And there was a lot of talking down of uh, people who wanted to trash, which was a sort of classic situation, uh, trash the offices. Uh, and then as we, uh, as we succeeded in having no damage done, uh, as the night went on, we began to realize we'd be arrested in the morning by the same Boston tactical police that had uh, uh, beaten students earlier in the week. And we really were concerned that, um, that the provocateurs did not win the day because they would have wanted that arrest to be violent. And we were very concerned that, the, that it would be, remain a peaceful protest and a nonviolent arrest. And I just remember how, uh, wh what a presence Howard was uh, throughout that night uh, in keeping the big perspective, what we were really, what we were really well, I, I for, think it is we true doing. that, I think it is true that while violence has, has changed the world, unfortunately, men of nonviolence and women of nonviolence at, uh, like uh, Gandhi and Martin Luther King, Howard, have had uh, a big impact by remaining committed to non-aggression against even one's uh, adversaries. There's a wonderful woman whom we're going to see Wednesday night in New York, Lema Govi, who uh, led the women in white in Liberia in nonviolent tactics that helped to overthrow Charles Taylor, the dictator. So all I can say is I salute what Howard stands for and. And, and anyone who actually puts his or her body on the line but refuses to ask anybody else, uh, to, to harm anybody else in doing that. Yes. And then we're going to, I think, unfortunately, we have to stop because it's after nine now, and I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I read something in the New York Times the other day uh, that really uh, shocked the hell out of me. And uh, it was a poll about uh, the shifts that have occurred this year in political views. And one of the things it said, I believe, was that uh, women, and it might have been women independents, but women have now shifted away from the Democratic Party for the first time since 1982. And in fact, uh, my impression is that women were responsible for both Obama and Clinton uh, getting elected. Um, and my question to you is, how is it now that uh, it appears some of the most prominent women politicians 
in the country are uh, particularly uh, horrible uh, e examples of politicians. What is going on here? I don't understand. Well, <laughs> women are different, thank God, uh, but power is gender neutral. And I always said before she was in office that one day we're going to get the first woman president or woman prime minister of England, and it turned out to be Margaret Thatcher because her belief system, her DNA was different from uh, everybody else. Uh, so, I mean, I, I do think women have this nurturing capacity that is very, uh, is, 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 is very uh, affirming in, in some politics, but I also think you can have a absolutely uh, despotic woman uh, in, uh, as well, and that goes to power and ambition, which is, as I said, not gender, it's gender neutral. It can, it can reside, in, ambition can reside in anybody, and so can bad taste. <laughs> All right, one more. Go ahead. You're the last. Yep. Uh, I have a question regarding about jobs. Uh, what's happening with the jobs? Uh, United States government's budget is $14 trillion and unemployment is rising. So what's happening with the jobs? Well, f for one thing, uh, as I indicated earlier, corporations sitting on record profits are not spending their money on infrastructure and innovation and building things that give people jobs. That's a big fact. Most jobs do come from the private sector, including, by the way, small businesses account for more jobs than, than, than large businesses, and small businesses are in trouble. Uh, I often say, if you want to know, if you want to know the impact of money in politics, look at the shops that are shuttered in your neighborhood. So small businesses are not, are not hiring now, uh, and that's a problem. But the $14 trillion, much of that goes to the interest, which pay, is paid to the financial community and to the people who bought treasuries. And that's not creating, per se, uh, jobs. We have a sputtering economy, uh, an economy that is not uh, creating uh, new opportunities. We're moving from creating things to serving things. And, that means lower job, lower paying jobs. We've got to get a lot of that money, you're right, freed back into supporting innovation. We've got to get the, the uh, big corporations to investing that cash in, in, in people and, and, and the future. Uh, and we, we're going through a period in which if we don't come out of it with a lot of innovation, we, the, this republic will become a banana republic. And most people will be working week to week for, for pay instead of a sustained investment. I am losing my voice. I'm sorry about that, but thank you very much. For <laughs>